What's up? I'm Hutch, and you need to understand abnormal gait patterns so that you can better correct these in your patient, and also pass the NPTE. The best way to really understand these gait patterns is actually just to see them in real life, but I'm going to try to find the best video clips I can of people demonstrating these gait patterns so that you can get an idea. First, we have an antalgic gait pattern. This is basically just a painful limp. Usually the contralateral limb is going to have a shorter swing and step length because the patient wants to take the weight off of their painful limb as much as possible. An ataxic gait can also be called a cerebellar gait. And these patients kind of look like they're drunk. They have a wider base of support, they're stumbling, and they're just really unsteady. A circumduction gait can also look like a hemiplegic gait. Basically, they have to abduct the limb and swing it around because they don't have enough strength or range of motion in their leg in order to just bring the limb straight forwards. Equine gait is really common in children who have cerebral palsy, and it just kind of looks like they're toe walking, usually because they have increased gastrocnemius activation. Festinating gait is also called Parkinsonian gait because this is something you'll see really commonly in your patients with Parkinson's disease or similar disorders and they essentially take really really small steps and look like someone has kind of pushed them forwards and so they'll keep taking these small small steps with their momentum going forwards until they fall. A scissoring gait is like a crossover gait where basically their foot crosses midline. Spastic gait can also be common in children with cerebral palsy. They'll look really stiff, maybe their toes will drag, and usually their hips and knees are adducted and flexed. A steppage gait can look like a tabotic gait. Basically this patient is exaggerating their hip flexion and then once their foot hits the ground they have a foot slap. So usually because they don't have enough control over their dorsiflexors. Trendelenburg gait is something that you hear about a little bit more often. This is where they have a contralateral hip drop due to glute medius weakness. And finally, there is vaulting gait, which is where they have a hip rise. Maybe they go up onto their toe to allow their contralateral limb to swing through. So maybe that side, again, doesn't have enough range of motion. So rather than doing a circumduction gait on the injured side, they're doing a vaulting gait on the uninjured side to allow that leg to swing straight forwards. Now, by all means, this is not a end-all be-all list of gait patterns, but these are some of the main ones that you'll come across and that you should know for the NPTE. Now it's time for or NPT Jeopardy. Pause the video now if you want time to read and think about the question. Otherwise, you've got five, four, three, two, one. There are a lot of different exercises you could pick here to be fair. The idea is that you want to stretch the calves and hamstrings while working them, so backwards walking is a good option. Hopefully that covers all of our bases. If not, you can always check out the description box below for a link to my notes on Etsy, or you can comment with questions or suggestions for videos I should do in the future. Otherwise, good luck studying. Go change the world.